The Best of Living in Iowa is funded in part by the Gilchrist Foundation. Founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television. Hello, this is Morgan Halgren. For 16 seasons, Living in Iowa told the tale of what it means to be uniquely Iowan. Tonight, we honor that spirit by bringing you another glimpse into our rich heritage with a few stories from our archives. In this episode of The Best of Living in Iowa, we'll take delivery on Iowa's Depression-era post office murals, take a flight into the past on antique wings, and find out how doo-wop singer and insect exterminator Jim Freeman got the bug. In much the same way that the bounty of Coldwater Cave lay right beneath our feet, there are gems of artwork right in front of our eyes in post offices and public buildings around the state. They are large-scale examples of regionalist art, the style that earned Grant Wood a permanent place in American art history. This quick time tour may give you a better idea of how valuable they really are. If your post office looks like this, chances are you'll find one of these over the postmaster's door. In the 1930s, during the Great Depression, the WPA put people to work building post offices, and an unprecedented government program funded artists to paint murals. This painting deserves to be famous, and there were real people painted into it and lampooned in various ways, but for somebody to think of painting a corn parade and have the audacity to put it in the post office and, and bring smiles to people's faces, Greg Narber and Leah Rawson DeLong co-authored a book on the mural projects in Iowa. There was a great uh, richness of artistic treasures here in the state that really nobody seemed to be at that time very much aware of. They were painted to last. They were intended to, to be murals similar to the murals of Renaissance Italy in, in a sense, that they would last that long. The center scene of this mural in Clarion is presumed to be a farm foreclosure. But most murals portrayed idyllic settings and not the misery of the Depression. They felt like they were helping people's attitudes and lifting them in some way and really making a positive contribution to people with their art. Artists, encouraged by Grant Wood, the most famous regionalist artist, looked to their own surroundings for subject matter. In 1933, as state director of the PWAP, the Public Works of Art Project, Grant Wood supervised the painting of murals in the library at Iowa State University. One of the many artists recruited by Grant Wood for the project was Lee Allen. To cut down the glare with cornstarch, patting this cornstarch mixture up, it, it took the glare off, but a few years later, they, had mold, they began to mold. And I was given the job of cleaning the, that cornstarch off of those murals. During his many years of service to government, Lee was paid $42 a week. Not long after the Iowa State University project ended, Lee painted two post office murals. I enjoyed those days. I had the Model T Ford, and you could go forever on a tank of gasoline and that. I was not worried a bit. I had all the self-confidence in the world. I knew I could paint better than anybody else, you see. I thought I could. Lee's strong belief in conservation influenced him to naturally paint murals on that subject. Over 60 years of dust and dirt have been cleaned from many of the murals, but here, a small portion of the canvas was left untouched demonstrating the dramatic difference. The Depression was also the era of the Dust Bowl, and with that in mind, Lee illustrates, on the left, causes of erosion, and on the right, soil erosion prevention. I had quite an argument with my father, as a matter of fact. He said, you can't earn a living at it. 
And I said, well, I don't care whether I can or not. I'm going to do it. Turned out he was right. After the government closed those uh, sources of income down, we all had to take some other work. Lee used his talents as a medical illustrator for the eye department at the University of Iowa. He became well known for his work with photography and developed equipment to improve techniques for photographing the eye. And when I look back, it actually seems to me that I'm looking at a different person. I'm seeing myself in an entirely different way with time. A larger-than-life, colorful crowd gathers to see the Corridon Volunteer Fire Department in action. Naturalist John James Audubon, namesake of the town and county, is depicted during his travels by flatboat. Entitled Rural Free Delivery, Leon's mural seems to reveal a social statement regarding the controversy surrounding rural free delivery when townsfolk had to pay for a post office box. The costuming of these figures more closely resembles gauchos than Iowa farmers as they travel to Ida County's first fair. Murals also grace the halls of other public buildings. The Des Moines Public Library's mural cycle is by far the largest and took four years to complete. Named a social history of Des Moines, it depicts the creation of the earth, wars, and an idyllic world order. The mural at Harrison School in Cedar Rapids was painted by Grant Wood, but was destroyed by a fire. A few years later, an impressive mural by William Henning called Transportation was created to portray the evolution of travel. A group of students known as Callanan Couriers explained the details of their two murals to visitors. Well, some students in my school had pointed out how the men were shoveling coal and sand and the women were in sewing and typing and everything, which is not really up to date with the 90s, you know. So this guy right here in the green shirt, he, uh, he has a special little thing on his belt buckle, and that's, it kind of goes with the era. And I think it's special how we have it here at County, and it kind of sets us apart from the rest of the middle schools. It kind of goes along with the learning atmosphere here. It's truly remarkable that almost all of the murals in Iowa have survived, except for these. To help forget about the WPA years, a magnificent 100-foot-long mural at the Iowa State Fairgrounds was cut up for scrap wood. A hanging scene in a Cedar Rapids federal courthouse distracted jurors and was painted over. And an attempt to remove the canvas from the post office wall in Hamburg resulted in disaster. Fortunately, two of John Bloom's murals still beautify the Tipton and DeWitt post offices. Typical of where I was born. And the horses come through here like this, and the guy walks right alongside and throws the corn up against the bang board. Uh, the dog always follows along. Grant Wood recognized John's talent and put him to work on the Ames mural. They had a two-deck scaffold on rollers like this, and I was working on the second deck, painting a twisted rope. And I went down, I'd painted about three or four feet of it. I looked down, here was fella painting on the other end, coming up. The Tipton Post Office mural demonstrates John's love of sketching animals, combined with his keen eye for composition. All but a handful of post office murals are painted on canvas and placed on the wall like wallpaper. However, Missouri Valley's Iowa Fair scene was painted on plaster in true fresco style. The arrival of the first train is framed around the postmaster's door. Ironically, today Osceola is a stop on the Amtrak route. Agriculture sustaining civilization is the common basic theme in Harlem. Rockwell City's post office mural, called Summer, is an idealistic farm scene portraying a typical Iowa farm family at work. We hope that the communities that still have these murals treasure them and protect them, and we hope that people do see them as worth saving and worth learning from. Mention the topic of antique airplanes to anyone interested in aviation and the conversation will liven up. The nostalgia and excitement these flying machines generate is hard to describe. You almost have to be there.
So every year around Labor Day, proud pilots fly their rare birds to a grassy airstrip in South Central Iowa for a weekend of plain talk. That silver blue streak is a rare Fairchild XNQ-1 Navy trainer, one of only two planes of its kind still flying in the world. Ed Wegner owns the only Spartan C3 still winging it, and he loves to share the thrill of open cockpit flight with everyone. This nearly extinct bi-wing was built in 1929, and Ed has owned it for 36 years. But why would he fly from Wisconsin to a tiny grass airfield in Blakesburg, Iowa? Because it's the home of the Antique Airplane Association and the Air Power Museum. Grass is much better to operate off these kind of airplanes because they were designed and flown off of grass fields originally. Uh, there's no air show, it's, it's strictly a uh, fly old airplanes, talk old airplanes, live old airplanes, breathe old airplanes. The sights, sounds, and smells of antique aircraft abound throughout the Labor Day weekend. Pilots fly in from around the country to swap stories and old airplane parts. This is a 1929 General Aristocrat I purchased for the princely sum of $750 many, many years ago. And uh, I had to buy other parts and pieces from five different airplanes and eventually put this one uh, together. It's one of a kind. Uh, they, this company built about 40 of them. One broke, one belly up in 1929. Robert explained that after Lindbergh's flight across the Atlantic in 1927, the aviation industry really took off. But after the stock market crash in 1929, the number of companies building planes in the U.S. dropped from more than 180 to about 15. And a lot of these airplanes represent those lost dreams, those lost hopes when these people were going to become rich and famous and all building airplanes and selling airplanes. This is one of Robert's five antique airplanes. His greatest satisfaction comes from restoring them, but his greatest thrill comes during the first test flight. When you're pitting your knowledge and your skills against uh, machinery that may be 50, 60 years old, to know that you're up in the air and that your handiwork and that your skill has got you there and it's going to have to get you back down again. The first flight of any airplane is uh, pretty intriguing. So one day I put the wings on, and of course I wanted to fly it. I was just going to lift it off a little bit, see. It was pretty interesting. I got it back home again. It was, I think the flight lasted something like uh, 48 seconds. I thought I'd been gone three or four hours. I was soaking wet, totally exhausted. Yeah, you know, I think any first flight can be interesting. Well, was this Cessna originally a a wing warper, or was it the... Yeah, you're right. Was yeah, a yeah it was originally a wing warper. But, you know, there were so many so many oh, fatalities yeah. caused by yeah, the, the light structure in the, in the wing and everything else yeah, that... Uh, Tom loves to talk about old planes, especially his replica of a 1911 Cessna. He built it without blueprints, but derived the scale measurements from 8 by 10 photographs and gathered more information from newspaper articles. Some modifications were made to make it fly a little easier, but it was still hands-on flying all the way from Kansas. My first aeroplane ride was, uh, I was just a child, probably six or seven years old, in 1933. It was a ride I'll never forget. Those were the days when you heard an aeroplane fly over, you ran out to look to see what it was. Now we had a farm over by La Villa and the barnstormers used to come in on weekends and they'd sell rides about maybe a 10 minute ride for, if I remember, it was a dollar. Everybody from town drove out to see the aeroplane. Ed's 1946 Aranka Champ has a metal frame and wooden wing spars covered with fabric. 
the original skin was grade A cotton sprayed with aircraft dope to tighten it and make it smooth. They took it apart, took the fabric off, completely restored it. It's just like a brand new airplane. I think it's just for the love of old airplanes. Well, I've given a lot of people their very first aeroplane ride. My granddaughter made her first solo flight in this, this airplane, and she now has her student license. Well, it's just for the fun of seeing somebody smile uh, when you take a kid for his first airplane ride. We're trying to get the kids interested because we got to get the new generations coming. Uh, uh, we got to get them interested in aviation, get them interested in the old airplanes and keep them flying. Steve's interest in aviation began early. As a child, he constantly drew airplanes in school and irritated his teachers. This is one of Steve's nine antique airplanes, which he hopes will become his retirement fund as prices soar. This one's not exactly a real jewel because I've never really done anything to it yet, uh, never restored it yet. I know of one last week that sold for $40,000. Oh, I don't really call it exciting, but it's satisfying to be able to help somebody to get what they need to be here. There's several airplanes that are here because we've helped them find what they need. And that's the part that the Antique Airplane Association plays, is helping these people find the parts. The large number of rare aircraft that flew in that weekend were a tribute to the Antique Airplane Association, headquartered at this small grass airstrip in Blakesburg, Iowa. If not for the efforts of dedicated members, the sights and sounds of these aged airplanes would be just a faded memory. To watch Jim Freeman at work, you would assume he's just your average hard-working guy. And at 60 years of age, he would be the last one on earth to sing his own praises. But not too long ago, millions of people were praising his singing. And when we discovered that fact, we decided to bug him about it. The year was 1956. Ike was elected to a second term. We wrung our hands over things like the Cold War, nuclear threat, and the space race. The post-war economy marked one of the most prosperous times in American history. While cities burst into suburbia, mom and dad raised the baby boomer generation. In popular music, the Five Satins tune, In the Still of the Night, rose to number two in the pop charts, even ahead of a newcomer by the name of Elvis. A lot of them uh, let me know that, God, we didn't know uh, our pest control man had done, you know, that singing thing and all. But no, I, don't, I didn't tell anybody about that. What Jim Freeman of Norwalk, Iowa didn't reveal in casual conversations is that he is a bug man with soul. In 1956, the five satins were climbing to national stardom. Surprisingly, Jim sang bass in that group whose hit single has sold over 10 million copies to date. When the record broke, you know, uh, I was attending school then, but uh, the lure of show business and plus that record shooting up in the charts, I dropped out of uh, college and uh, went on the road, you know, in uh, the early part of 56. Looking back, Jim remembers the apprehensive support from his mother his own fears and excitement, and how unprepared he and the other Satins were for the journey they were about to begin. He's in a church basement recording it, you know, and uh, he just never thinks something like this was gonna happen. But the record shot off the charts again. You're on a national level now. And the next thing, they started calling me about booking us, you know. We had no routines, one little uniform that my mother had uh, stitched together and all with an S on it, you know, for satin, you know, stupid stuff, but what did we have? Anyway, uh, Not hey, long after being pushed into the bright lights of national fame, the five satins were approached by the legendary Apollo Theater in Harlem. Then a mecca to all striving black musicians, nearly all of today's legends have passed through its hallowed gates.
The first time we were at the Apollo, there was Bo Diddley. He was headlining. There was uh, Little Richard. And uh, yeah, it was scary. Uh, we didn't even have pictures to put on the marquee, you know. They had a blank place where the five satins was, so they had to rush us downtown New York to the studio, and that's when we took that picture up there. That was the same uh, day we're starting at the Apollo. The Satins never expected to appear at the Apollo or to top the national charts. They began by singing in the halls of their high school and at friends' parties. Personally, Jim would have been fine with just that. We just wanted a record. You know, if I just took it home and nobody else seen it, I'd just play it over and over. I would have been satisfied with that or play for some, you know, some little girls that might come by the house or at a party or something, but no, not in my wildest dreams that I think anything like this would happen to us. A good deal of the Satin's appearances in those days were in the South. In the mid-50s, America was reluctantly beginning to address its racial problems. Scarred, but with a sense of humor, Jim recalls those troubled times. The uh, name of the package was the Top Ten Review of 1956. This was our first tour. This one white fella would sit up there behind the bus driver. And anyway, we made our first stop, and uh, he asked us for our orders. You know, and uh, you got Chuck Berry and people like, give me a cheeseburger and fries and onions or whatever. He's sitting in there, air-conditioned, eating a steak and comes out and gives us the entertainers are, who's got the hamburg, who's got the fries. That was his sole job, you know. He didn't do nothing else. Jim has seen incidents like these diminish during his lifetime. And now in 1998, instead of suffering the disrespect of a confused nation, Jim has been honored for his achievements as a musician and for his contributions to American music history. When the call came in, she said, are you the Jim Freeman that sang with the Five Satins? I told her, yes. So she says, well, I've been trying to contact you, and uh, you're being inducted into the Rhythm and Blues Hall of Fame. I didn't want to leave New York. I didn't want to leave nothing. <laughs> I look out now for my limo. It's not there no more. <laughs> right down to the pest can in his hand, he still prefers to keep his past concealed. There just is not much ego to spare in this inconspicuous man. And that's the way he'd rather have it. My wife didn't even know uh, when I married her uh, that I had sang at one time. I guess about a year into our marriage, and the still of the night was playing while we were eating dinner. And uh, I just casually said, you know, uh, God, they're playing our record out here, you know. And I think she said something like, yeah, well, pass the peas, all right, you know. Right, you know. I said, no, I'm serious. If I was famous, I don't, you know, fine, you know. But I just look at myself as Jim. You know, I got lucky. Yeah. But, uh, since this revival thing started and got a couple of awards, I guess I was famous, you know. <laughs> but uh, they just know me as the bug man. <laughs> and that's fine with me. The Best of Living in Iowa is funded in part by the Gilchrist Foundation. Founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television.